Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. We saw that when Gauss studied the question of sums of two squares, he introduced this Gaussian integers. And one of the reasons why it's so useful is because the ring of Gaussian integers is a unique factorization domain. So it has nice arithmetic. So the question here is, well, can we find uh, other arithmetically interesting examples of um, rings of integers? And that's what I want to do here in this video. I want to talk about rings of integers. And the key concept that we need here is this notion of being integrally closed. Okay? Suppose um, you have a commutative domain R. Um, we're going to call it integrally closed. Another word for that is normal if it satisfies the following condition. Basically, its integral closure inside its field of fractions K of R is going to be it itself. So remember, every element of R is integral over itself. But you're saying that there's no other integral elements, okay? So any uh, element that's integral over R, any fraction that's integral over the R is actually integral in that sense in there. So why is this an important concept? Well, uh, this proposition really tells you uh, why, okay? If you have any unique factorization domain, such as Z or ZR, then it, in fact, it is normal, okay? So let's see why that's true. And it's quite an easy proof that I can give to you. Suppose alpha equals alpha 1 on alpha 2. That's a fraction inside this fraction field. And suppose that's integral over r. So basically, we want to show that this then has to be actually in r, okay? so that this contains all the integral elements. So in other words, the denominator alpha 2 you can take to be a unit. So we can assume that that's not a unit. Okay. So the first thing that you do is that um, you're in a unique factorization domain. You can assume alpha 1, alpha 2, remember, are, are, are relatively prime. And also, this alpha is integral, so it satisfies some integral equation in monic polynomial, okay, whose coefficients rn minus 1 to r0 are going to be uh, inside uh, the uh, ring r here. And you can assume that r0 is not 0. If, uh, if not, um, if, if this is 0, then of course you can pull out a factor of alpha 1 on alpha 2, okay, and get a lower degree uh, monic equation. Okay, so what are we going to do to this? What we're going to do is we're going to multiply by alpha 2 to the n. So that will clear the denominator here, alpha 1 to the n. Here, alpha 2 to the n uh, clears all the denominator here, and you'll have an extra alpha 2 here, and so forth, all the way down to r0, alpha 2 to the n. And then what can you see here? Okay, so remember, we want to show that alpha 2 is a unit, and suppose it's not. We can bring all this uh, other terms, other than the first uh, term here, to the other side, and that's going to have a factor of alpha 2 in there. But this alpha 1 is relatively prime. And so that multiple of alpha 2 is alpha 1 to the n. And that can't hold. Okay? So we've shown that actually from that contradiction, alpha 2 has to be a unit. And so in fact, this alpha is inside R. Okay? So this is really telling you the reason why um, you want to look at this condition. Okay? If you want to have a chance of unique factorization, okay, you better uh, hope that it's normal. Okay, so We've seen that uh, this is an interesting condition. So the next thing is, well, how do you construct a normal domain? Okay, so let me show you. And it hinges on this proposition here. Okay, so suppose you have a commutative uh, ring extension S over R, which is integral, and T over S is integral. Then T is also an extension of R, and in fact T over R is an integral extension as well. Okay, so this is a transitivity type result. Okay. So let's see how you prove it. So we're going to pick alpha inside t, and we want to show that it's actually integral over this lower r. Okay, so we'll do that using the criterion um, I gave in my previous video in this playlist. And uh, we're going to construct some finite extension containing this alpha. So what's that? So the first thing that you know is, well, t over s is integral. Okay, so alpha satisfies some integral equation um, over s. So let's suppose it's this one here. And it's got a finite number of coefficients, s n minus 1 up to s 0. And the first thing we'll do is we'll construct this ring s prime, which is r adjoined with these elements um, s 0 up to s n minus 1, these uh, coefficients. And remember, these um, are uh, s is integral over r. So since s is integral over r, um, we saw this in the case where we have just two integral elements. Uh, a ring like this is actually a finite extension. So this s prime is a finite um, uh, extension of R. So you can give it a finite set of generators, say sigma 1 up to sigma R. They're the R module generators of this S prime. Okay, so let's have a look at this alpha. I'm going to construct now a um, ring extension that contains this alpha. It's going to be S prime alpha. 
And I'm going to show that this is actually a finite as an R module. Okay, finitely generated R module. So it's a finite extension of R. And if I've done that, of course, every element inside here will be integral over R, including alpha. So you'll get this result. Okay, so let's see why that's true. So the first thing is alpha satisfies a monic polynomial over S prime because actually we chose this um, S prime to contain the coefficients here. Okay, so that's the reason why it's true. So that means that this this has an S prime module, S prime plus S prime alpha plus all the way down to S prime alpha to n minus one. But to each of these S primes now, you can replace with a linear combination, R linear combination of these sigmas. So this sum here, you can write as a double sum writing each s prime as the sum of r times sigma i. And since there are a finite number of sigma i's and you only need to look at a finite number of powers of alpha, uh, this must be a finitely generated r module, and hence alpha is also integral over r. And this gives you the transitivity of this integral um, extensions. Okay, great. So let's just see uh, how we're going to use this. That's going to give us this following definition, uh, which includes uh, a corollary here. Okay, so uh, what are number theorists often interested in? They're often interested in finite extensions, field extensions of Q. And that's what's called a number field. So let K be such a finite extension of Q. Okay, what we're going to do now is we're going to have uh, construct a subring of K. What's that? It's going to be the integral closure of Z inside K. And we're going to denote OK. That's the common, fairly common sort of um, notation for it. And the point is that this is actually an integrally closed subring. Remember, we want to construct normal do domains or integrally closed domains. So this is an integrally closed subring. And in fact, its field of fractions is actually equal to the original K. Okay? And it's called the ring of integers inside K. Okay? So we've seen what this is in the special case that K is the Gaussian rationals, Q or join I. It's going to be just the Gaussian integers. Okay? So it nicely generalizes that situation there. Okay, so let's see why this is true. So I'm going to prove this first part here. What is K, uh, the field of fractions of OK? okay so, what's, so I claim that this is true. So I guess certainly the uh, field of fractions of this, because OK sits inside K, okay, this will be inside this K. So I need to show that any alpha inside K is actually inside here. Okay, it's a fraction of elements inside here. And how do I do that? Well, firstly, remember this K is a finite field extension of Q. So it has to satisfy some uh, Q-linear polynomial. So here's our Q-linear polynomial with all these betas inside Q. Okay, And well, of course, this alpha, uh, th this might not be uh, an integer polynomial. But what I want to say is that I'm going to create one. I'm going to multiply this alpha by uh, a sufficiently large integer. So if I do that, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply this whole equation by n to the n. So this n to the n times alpha n, I can rewrite as m alpha to the power of n. This n to the n times this, okay, I can write as, well, there's one copy of m here, and the other n minus 1 copies, I'm going to put together with the alpha, so I've got m alpha to the n minus 1, and so forth down. And now this becomes a polynomial, not in alpha, but in m alpha, as you can see. And what's happened to the coefficients? Well, the first one is just uh, the original one, 1. The next one gets multiplied by m. The next one gets multiplied by m squared and so forth. And so the point is that if you make m big enough, you can clear all the denominators in these betas and get an integral equation for this m alpha. So that means that some sufficiently large integer m times alpha is inside here. So of course, uh, the field of fractions of this will include alpha, um, this m alpha, which is in here, divided by m, which is alpha. So alpha is in the field of fractions of OK. So once you know this, uh, I guess the other part that you have to check that it, this is integrally closed. OK, so what's the integral closure of OK? Well, if alpha is integral over OK, so it's in the integral closure. OK, well, OK is also integral over Z, since that's the definition. OK, so OK alpha is integral over Z by this proposition. Okay, this proposition here, the transitivity of integrality. Okay, alpha integral over OK means that this uh, extension is integral over uh, OK, and then OK is integral over Z, so this OK alpha is integral over Z. So in particular, um, alpha is integral over Z. Okay, so alpha being integral over Z means that it's an integral closure of Z inside K, so it's inside OK by definition. 
Okay, so that's rather nice. Okay, so this gives you a way to construct integrally closed subrings. Okay, and these uh, integrally closed subrings, their field fractions will be um, uh, whatever number field that you like. And this is called the ring of integers inside K. So let's just look uh, at the special case of uh, quadratic fields. Okay, so you can write every quadratic field in this way. So let's suppose D is some sort of an integer. And we can assume it's uh, going to be square free because we just want to join a square root of D to this. So if there are any squares in there, we can throw them away. Okay. So K will just be Q adjoin the square root of D. And the question is, what is the ring of integers uh, of this quadratic field extension? And the uh, answer is actually a little bit more interesting than you might expect. Okay. So uh, for example, if D equals minus one, we saw that this is just the Gaussian rational, so you get the Gaussian integers. And you may think that's the general sort of pattern that this ring of integers is you start with z and you just adjoin root d and that's in fact the case if d is congruent to two or three modulo four for example if you have um, d equals minus one it's congruent to three modulo four however if d is congruent to one modulo four actually you'll have to throw in some extra elements okay there'll be linear combinations of in one and root d um, which involve denominators. So this is actually z adjoined minus one plus root d on two. That's going to be the ring of integers. Okay, so let's just look at the special case d equals minus three. Okay, if d equals minus three, you put a minus three in here. This is minus one plus i root three on two. And hopefully you recognize that this is just the uh, primitive cube root of unity e to the two pi i on three. So in this case here, when d equals minus three, the ring of integers is z adjoined this cube root of unity. And being a cube root of unity means that this, of course, has to be integral. Okay? And you can check that, um, actually, once you have this, in this ring, you will also get things like the square root of minus 3, and also, of course, all the integers are in there. Okay? So this is, um, these rings of integers, okay, if you want to think about what should you do, if you want to try to study okay, arithmetic in a similar way to how Gauss studied um, sums of squares, uh, using Gaussian integers, okay? This is the correct thing to use, the rings of integers inside number fields as given here. I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics.